All right, we should be live. So if you're in the chat, let us know. Just can you hear and see everything okay? See, we have Chess Simple, we have Jad in the chat, we have Lucas in the chat. Let us know. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're from. Um, what we're going to do today is we have our French defense instructors, Lucas and Justin. So you'll see Lucas right below me, and then Justin's on the bottom of your screen. And they're here to answer questions on the French Defense course. We're going to go through some lines, um, maybe go through some games. But we want you guys as students to be able to ask as many questions as you want here. And you can kind of help guide this stream as well. So if anyone has any questions off the bat, go ahead and drop them in the chat. And let's see. Justin, do you want to kick us off maybe and just tell us a little bit about like overview of this course, kind of how it started, how Lu Lucas and you got working together st and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, so uh, Lucas kind of kicked off the course um, and expressed interest in the idea of doing the course. And Matt was talking to me while we were making it, uh, I, I believe the Sicilian course um, about it. And I was like, oh, I... You know, I played the French a lot. Like I, I played it pretty much from when I was a, a sixteen hundred level player to when I was like a master. Like I played it like a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of games in the French, um, and so I expressed my interest in doing it. And then that's kind of how we got started with the course. Um, and yeah, it's it's been great. I've uh, learned a few cool ideas, and I think it's a really great opening. That you guys should uh, definitely check out. And Lucas, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background on the French defense and kind of how this got started? Yeah, actually, uh, I was seeking for an opening to play against 1e4. And back then, I wasn't like so firm on the theory and I just wanted something simple. And then I actually started to play e4b6. And then uh, at some point, I just realized that. This opening also leads to some French positions. And so I tried out the French and immediately fell in love with the opening. And I explored some cool lines and realized it's like quite fighting opening, despite just having the reputation to just be yeah, kind of passive, this bad life squad bishop, and you just get checkmated at some point. But it's really not the French, it's just a great opening that is black a lot of good uh, play out of the opening and in most cases actually white just has struggled to keep the center together yeah, yeah i think that's something that i realized kind of once i started to see your guys' lines is i had the same thought about the french like all the french you know i'm a carol Kahn player like all the french is just like a bad version of the carol um, but you start to look into the lines and it's you can get very fighting dynamic positions just like we try to do in the Carol Khan course. All right, so we have Peter in the chat saying hi from Las Vegas. Um, if anyone wants to start on a certain chapter or has a question, put that in the chat. Otherwise, if you guys as coaches want to start on a certain chapter, we could do that or we could look at a game. What do you think? I'm open to anything. I, I just kind of want to add because I think it's a little funny. Um, once I played e4, e6, because I, I wanted to play French. I played this guy like so many times and I wanted to surprise him. And then after d4, I played b6 because I wanted to get my light square bishop out um, and play a French still and just like get out of book. I actually got a decent position out of the opening, but it, it's not a good opening. So definitely play d5. d5 is always the best. Um, but it's just an interesting idea I thought I'd share. I think Daniel in our chat does play some B6 lines. He told me about that before. Um, but mm -hmm. we do have a request from Peter. He wants to look at the advanced variation a bit. Um, I'm kind of curious to see the solid variations first, just to see like what sort of setup can we get against white when they don't come at us too hard. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So maybe we can kind of walk through, like start with the main line. Let's see. Oh, and knight d2 line. Okay, which is the knight to d2 line? That's the Tarash. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Yeah, I think we'll I think we'll get back to the advance later on. I think we're having a, a technical issue with that. Um with the, the chapter for that. But anyway, the, the Tarash, um, what we're recommending is after the starting position and then knight to d2. Um, the idea of knight to d2 is to get out of bishop to b4. Um, so they could just meet that with c3. And this is a really tricky opening. This is what a lot of uh, the top players are doing and a lot of very strong players in general. Like I see this a lot um, when I play the French um, against like masters and such. So um, against this, the typical two ideas are, are to play knight to f6 and to play c5. But we're recommending to play bishop to e7 because it kind of it remains the flexibility to choose either line. So uh, what, you can kind of see why bishop d7 is important uh, a little bit later. So Lucas, when would be a good time to play a move like c5 and when would be a good time to kind of go to this knight to f6 um, yeah. kind of line? Yeah. To understand uh, when you have to play knight f6 on, or c5, first of all, you have to understand that knight f6 normally leads to more closed positions where white can just uh, lock the center with e5 and then our knight has to move and only then we're going to, to tackle the center later on. And if we play c5 immediately, white can uh, take on d5, for example, and this leads to a more open game. So uh, we're recommending to go knight f6 only if they commit uh, to knight g3 uh, on the fourth move. So when you get this, we have kind of a closed structure uh, that is similar to uh, the lines we would get if you play knight f6 on the third move. But uh, if we would play knight f6 just on the third move without bishop e7, they could uh, get this version where they play f4 and then white just has this massive center which again support with c3 and that's just too much we uh, do not want to go into this it's playable but uh, nowadays it's kind of hard to uh, find something that gets you a comfortable position if white's well prepared and yeah just the immediate c5 is of course also playable this is so called open tarage but it's tends to flatten out a bit. Black has still kind of wary of the different move orders and it's just easy for white to get comfortable play against this. And with bishop uh, e7, you're just keeping all the flexibility. So if they play knight g3, we go with knight f6 and now we have a closed tarage but without f4 uh, from white. And if they play, for example, uh, bishop d3, and do not commit the knight to f3, then you play c5. And now that the bishop is kind of blocking the side, side of the queen, we can get into more open structures quite comfortable. Yeah, I agree. So we have a question. After c5, c3, is it better to take d4 or push? I'm assuming it's this position that Minaj is asking about. Um, we, I mean, this is kind of a common question in any French position because we're always going to play C5. Uh, pretty much every line we look at, C5 is a move we're going to play um, to try to break at the center. And sometimes C4 is good. But my general rule of thumb is just to never play it. Because um, we, I mean, we we look at um, some lines in the advance where it's pretty common to play C4, but we just try to avoid that in general just to make it simple. So you don't have to worry about like 
should I play C4 or not? We just want to target the center and C4 doesn't target the center. C4 is moving away from the center because you were controlling the center and now you're not when you play C4. Um, so we want to target the center. We want to put pressure on this D4 pawn. So therefore it's best to take on D4 at some point, but most likely just keep the stretch in here. There's no reason to take right away. Um, instead, we could just like, like it's very well protected. If they take, we're just going to take back with the bishop and we're going to be happy. So um, we can take. And usually when we do take, we want to take because we're isolating their pawns. So for example, in this position, this might be a time where we'd want to take. Because once white takes back and we take on e4, this pawn on d4 is going to be extremely weak. Um, and after knight takes e4, we actually cannot take it because bishop b5 check would lose our queen. But um, this is still a very weak pawn here that we could try to corral later in the game once we develop our pieces. And uh, since we have really good control of this d5 square, that pawn is not going anywhere. So we only want to take on d4 when we're either like going to win it or we're going to be able to do like fork b2 and d4. Like there, there's a few... Uh, circumstances where we might want to take um, and taking isn't like gonna ruin your position and, and like if you don't know whether to take or not it's probably not going to ruin your position if you do take um, but sometimes it is keep, nice to keep the tension it really just depends sometimes it's nice to uh, try to break down the center weaken the d4 pawn um, so it just depends on the position but here um, we would want to take so we can weaken this isolated d4 pawn. And I like in this position how we're transitioning to the IQP. So it's like we kept that tension c5 and d4, but we know we can transition to the isolated queen pawn with the trade. So then we go for it. And then we're able to play with this structure, like Justin said, and, and try to target that d4 pawn long term. Let's see. So I'm going to the chat. Jago does want to look at the knight c3 line. We switch over to that. Sure. Yeah. Maybe um, you check. So you, the the knight c3 line is uh, when they play knight c3 after we play d5. So they're protecting the e4 pawn. And against this, a uh, typical line is to play the widower, but we're actually recommending playing the classical variation which is knight to f6 here. And this uh, has a lot of branching points. For example, here, it's pretty common for white to play bishop to g5. So we have a chapter on that. Um, and it's also pretty common for white to just push and try to get as much space in the center as possible. Um, and this makes sense, right, that we're giving them the center. So we're letting them do this, so they might as well take it. Um, and in response, we kind of get to chip away at the center. So we start with c5, knight to f3, knight to c6. Every move has a purpose. We're trying to get at that d4 pawn, but they keep developing. And the bottom line here is that we're going to be able to pressure not only the center, but also the queen side in general. The queen side is a little bit loose. Um, and we'll see how that happens in the future. So how does the line continue from here, Lucas? Yeah. Uh, this position is kind of a main tabia position where they can play a lot of things like a6, queen b6, c takes d4, uh, c takes d4 followed by queen b6. But we're just opting for the move bishop e7. At first, this looks kind of calm. Just, yeah, putting a bishop on is quite passive square and just getting ready to castle. But it's quite tricky for white to just continue. So. Normally they play queen d2 to get ready to castle. And here we just uh, short castle our king. And white already can go horribly wrong here. For example, the most played move in a club database is just long castle. But this fails uh, to a simple reason that black is much faster in the queen side attack uh, than white's on the, with the king side attack. So this is uh, one one point where we actually do play c4 
uh, just because we are locking a center and gaining space on the pawn uh, on the queen side to just overrun white. And one quite nice example uh, for this line could be if they uh, now play g4, uh, we play b5, and we're just attacking. And this is completely different from the like normal reputation of the French, where white gets a bishop in d3 and we gift us or anything. Here we just pawn storming them. And for example, should they take? We just gain the open file and attack. A fun line could be uh, we take the knight, knight b4, and should they uh, now try to kick us away? We have this nice move. Uh, c3, and should they take, which is mating. And these, uh, these like motifs are quite common where white just develops normally and black gets a nice initiative and yeah, good attacking chances uh, in these lines. And it happens quite often in the course that black's just faster in the play and white really has to defend and be kind of passive. So uh, after queen e2, short castle, uh, because they cannot cast long in, uh, immediately, they normally do other things like bishop e2 to short, cast a short or taking first. But here we're also just getting nice play. Should they just go bishop e2? Uh, we're opting for a6 to expand on queen side. The castle and we play b5. And we've already just gotten a quite comfortable position where our queenside play is yeah, pretty, pretty significant and white hasn't really started any major expansion. Yeah, they have a nice center, but we can slowly chip away at it. And yeah, black's getting just good play. And just to sh uh, show one example how to actually get this kind of passive flight square bishop into play. So maybe when you play a3 to stop b4, we play queen b6 to pressure the center. They step out of this diagonal. We're just taking now to activate our pieces. And after they have finished their development, we park our bishop on b7 and then chip uh, away the center with f6. And slowly but surely, this diagonal will open up and there are just uh, some games in the database where actually uh, this bishop is a strong piece at least to a big mating attack uh, onto g2. So, yeah. And basically that, that's one of the best lines white can get from an objective standpoint and it's equal. So. And I think yeah. this sort of position, it's kind of easy for white to fall asleep on that b7 bishop. And they just think, oh, the bishop's trapped by the pawn on d5. It's not doing anything. This can become really dangerous for white as soon as we're able to play pawn to d4. So eventually it's going to happen. That bishop will come to life on b7. Um, okay, so a quick question for you guys before we go to the next chapter. Out of all the chapters, what is each of your favorite lines in the course or favorite chapters in the course? Hmm. I'd, I'd say this uh this classical variation one is pretty nice but uh i i like preferentially like the uh the bishop to g5 line which is let's just pull it up after bishop to g5 which, um which chapter justin i have to follow you oh uh sorry it is the classical for bishop g5 okay got it um and then after d takes e4, and it takes e4, bishop e7, and we get these doubled pawns that look really ugly, but I think that it's just, I think it's beautiful. I love these doubled pawns. Um, you get this open g file, you just, just really dynamic play. It's not really like any other position. Um, and it's still pretty equal. Like, it's not like we're giving white a huge advantage to get this play. Um, I just, I just think it's really nice. We can um, take our time, get our bishops on really nice squares. We can even castle queenside in some lines to pressure d4. Um, I think it's just a really fun position and a nice uh, structure that you really don't see too often, but uh, I, I really like. 
yeah, these lines are nice. Uh, I personally like the also the classical, it was 93. Uh, and what's funny is uh, by all the like high level theoreticians, 93 is just considered to be like the most critical line white can play at all. But black's just getting so easy play in like most lines in the course. And I believe there's only like one or two lines where we have be kind of cautious and yeah, have really nice plays where I just tackle the center. And one cute uh, example could be uh, the line where they play uh, knight c2, which looks kind of odd at first, but they just want to restructure c3. But if we follow the most natural moves. Which uh, chapter are you on, Lucas? Uh, it's classical uh, with e5, uh, e5 part two. Okay, I'm on it now. So, for example, uh, here where they play f4, and basically white saying, I want it all, just give me a big center, everything's solid. Uh, we have easy play with just queen b6 tackling the center. When they restructure, we play f6, another typical French defense break to chip away the e5 pawn. And then, when they just build this massive dark square uh, wall, like this giant triangle uh, uh, we can just take once and play bishop before uh, check and here it's also kind of funny the most played uh, and most natural looking move in the database is bishop d2 but this just fails tech uh, tactically because this blocks uh, the eye of the queen so we can take once castle and should they now go for the most natural move bishop to two, or like basically the forced move to protect knight. We have this beautiful sacrifice, knight oh. takes e5, and white st structures just completely collapsing. If they, they take, they take again, they cannot take because this just gets mated. So they have to defend the piece. Uh, should they try to relieve the tension, we just gain this massive attack and why it's basically just getting crushed by yeah, all this pressure and the piece active. This actually uh, has won me a crucial game in the uh, city championship this, uh, this year. So it's just a nice liner. You know, I think a key in this line to remember is to play F6. Like, this is something that kills me all the time in the Carol. And I played the French OTV recently, very similar position to this. and. I couldn't remember to play f6. I was dancing around it, and I got a bad position. Later on, the game was still like dynamically balanced, but I, yeah, I just couldn't remember to play f6 because I was afraid of weakening the e pawn. But it's really not a weakness, and it just opens up the f file for your rook and opens up the center, and then creates that knight takes e5 tactic later. So once you know how to chip away at the center, I think there's a lot of good attacking chances for black here. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, especially after g3, g3 is a very weakening move here. Like, it looks really nice, this pawn structure, but it very quickly falls apart once we can kind of use this open f file. Um, but a lot of people get scared to play f6 because they don't like this pawn on e6. It's it's backwards, it's weak, um, and it's really, really scary because they have this open e file targeting it. They could even put this bishop on h3. And it is important to watch out for that, but what we get in return for this is a very active player. Bishop can go to this nice d6 square. Our knight can potentially hop onto this outpost um, on e4 because this f6 square was cleared. And castling, we got this half-open f-file. We still have some play in return for this somewhat backwards pawn. This d4 pawn can also be a, a target in a lot of positions. So we get some dynamic play uh, in return for this backwards pawn. All right. So we have, going back to the chat, we do have a question on the exchange variation. So uh, Ian asked this a little bit ago. What line is recommended against three e takes d5 exchange variation? So I'm jumping to chapter four now. Um, what do we recommend here, guys? 
So first, we're going to take back. Um, <laughs> and then after that, it really depends on, on what white does. If they play knight to f3, this is a very common move at the club level. Um, we are going to play bishop to d6. So the bishop is always, pretty much always, going to end up on the d6 square. I think there's some situations where we might win on e7. But d6 is a very active square. We're stopping the bishop from coming to f4. Um, so this bishop now doesn't really have a great square to go to um, because g5 isn't that great because we could kick it around with a move like f6 um, and push it back to a square, um, while f6 is kind of an improving move in the position. So anyway, this bishop is kind of a problem piece for white once we play bishop to d6. And to continue, we're going to play knight to e7. And we kind of have this flexibility. Again, uh, we see this in a lot of lines where we have a lot of flexibility. We have multiple options. We don't have to do the same thing over and over again. So we could play knight to c6, bishop to g4, queen d7, castle long. Or another kind of plan in some positions is to castle king side and play bishop to f5. So we trade um, our bad bishop for white's good bishop. Um, so a lot of different ideas that can happen here, and they're both pretty good. So as long as we um, try to remain active and and follow one of these plans, we should be in good shape um, for the exchange variation. Smithy Q is wondering about 4c4. Lucas, do you want to show us that line? Oh, yeah. Uh, just go back and plug this. This basically is similar to the Karakhan pan off attack. They just try to rip open the center and get active play. Uh, but here we just uh, go to our normal plan. We play knight f6 to support the pawn. And when it just activated, there are a lot of different lines, such as wish before or taking, or, but. We opt for this uh, kind of tricky sideline, bishop e6, because this just immediately forces a decision out of white to kind of commit uh, to a certain structure. Should they take, fine, then white just has an IQP and we can kind of go for normal play to target the IQP, where we yeah, want to blockade the pawn. Like we've already, we've already blockaded the pawn and just try to slowly attack it and trading pieces and winning it in the end. This position is equal, but I feel like it's much more easy to play for black because white isn't really getting anywhere with the attack. The only scary piece is the bishop on e3, and, but with the bishop on e7, we are never worried about uh, any Greek gift sacrifice as knight g5 just gets taken. So uh, this just a comfortable IQP position. And should they just try to keep the structure and push, we are fast enough to chip away the structure and they co cannot comfortably play before because a3 and to take and the pawn is pinned. So they have to kind of give up uh, some material and flex us better. So the Monte Carlo variation is not dangerous whatsoever if you just watch out to not get. Yeah, uh, re gifted by any. Uh, oh, that's a lot. You know, bishop e3, and that can simply prevent it, be simply prevented by bishop e7. That's actually a common theme in the course that we often just park our bishop on e7 to stop any knight g5 attacking moves by white. So, we, yeah, and I think it's also important to mention, um, like in a position like this right here. Um, the knight coming to f8 is also really important. Um, so first, when we start with bishop e7, we do this because we want to avoid the knight coming to g5 um, and harassing this bishop. And then later, um, like in a position like this, there's never really going to be any attack because we can always play knight to f8 and we have this g5. So our, our king is just very, very safe at the end of the day. It looks like we don't have, really have any defenders around, but these pieces 
uh, can very quickly come to the aid of the king. So there, there is really not that much danger uh, in this position. Um, we had a question in the chat from Chess Simple. Um, he wanted to know, how does the fact that the E pawn is gone instead of the C pawn for black affect this IQP? And I was thinking that the difference is when the E pawn is gone, our light square bishop is better. Like it can just park on E6, control the D5 square. Whereas when we have the pawn on E6, like in the caro, a lot of times it's hard to figure out where to put that bishop. Um, what do you guys think? I agree. I think that's a, a great way to put it. Absolutely. You also see this in some other lines where white just takes and taking just clears the situation for them because they do not have to worry about keeping the center in a locked structure, but also just frees up this bishop. And for example, in the other uh, lines in the exchange where we can just get the bishop on g4, uh, which is completely fine and, and active. And basically what we're trying to do is uh, tackle the exchange variation with as much imbalances as like, possible uh, to not allow white just this very solid and kind of boring positional grind, but rather we're just opting for an attack. And as Justin already mentioned, this problem piece Sometimes it just goes to g5, and then we can just start an attack on the king side. So do not fear the exchange variation in terms of boringness. It's really just an interesting line, and we get good fighting chances without having to worry about getting in, into any slow positional grind or anything like calm. So I'm looking at the chat. Minaj has some pretty funny comments. <laughs> One of the questions earlier on was playing the advanced variation and getting crushed by the Greek gift. How do you avoid that? Um, let's see. So one of our chapters got messed up, but let's go to chapter three, advanced aggressive. Do we have to worry about the Greek gift in, in this chapter? Uh, actually, uh, the term uh, advanced ag aggressive is uh, more or less a term for sidelines because normally in the uh, advanced white has to play knight c3 and knight f3. If they do not play this, their center can, can collapse so quickly. And should they uh, instead try to go for any like tricks with queen uh, g4 or anything, or like bishop b5? Black just gets a better position, at least practically, uh, where white just loses their central control. And sometimes we can just take here and then just continue with normal development. That's also something that's quite nice uh, in these typical French positions. Should white just start to go crazy and play any unorthodox lines where I put pieces on squares they normally do not go to? We can just follow up a simple like French like play and everything that basically puts pressure on the center is fine. So uh, the aggressive lines basically means like gambits and lines where white do, uh, does not go for this solid base structure. And yeah, they, uh, the lines was where, where they go, C3 and I, F3 are, we, we name this um, solid. Uh, because in, uh, in our recognition, of course, uh, we completely do cancel out the uh, most tricky and most aggressive ways white can play. So, uh, let me try, Lucas. Let me try something quick. Yeah. I think our game got overwritten by the other French game. Let me try something. Okay, chapter 13. Um, 
let's see. Ah, there it is. One second, one second. Test.com is being slow. But basically, uh, yeah. basically, in a normal uh, advanced version, while it tries to get aggressive in this, I mentioned uh, get in a Greek gift sacrifice with a bridge 1d3. And for this, they are also sometimes just gambiting a d4 pawn, which is called the Milner Barry Gambit. And the one thing about the Milner Barry Gambit is it was considered to be completely okay for black uh, back in the days. But like I mean, three, three years ago, uh, Super GMs just came up with an improved move order where white just uh, completely disregards the pawn on d4 and uh, like the solidity of their pawn structure where they're just going for the attack and uh, hunting for our king and playing dynamically. So we thought about a way to still get the typical French play and avoid these lines because they're, we've looked at it and it was best play blacks equal. And that means a lot. So they are really uncomfortable to, uh, to face. And we opted for a tricky sideline where it's actually in reverse. Uh, if white plays normally, black gets the attack and it's just really quick on the king side, and white has to kind of defend and back up and be passive. But uh, uh, so, for example, should I just uh, insert it in the normal chapter? Um, you can use chapter two if you want. You just have to enter in the moves because I think they got over and yeah, yeah I see right. it. So basically, if they go for the normal setup with C3 and I3, which is a chapter which we call solid because they're just keeping the center intact. Uh, if we were to go with uh, D7 or Queen B6, we would allow the Miller Barry Gambit. So I could show it. Uh, Like the old move order was uh, white just taking back and trying to get compensation by just chasing a queen. But uh, here white is, uh, black is just fine because you can back up and finish development. But in a, a kind of new version, white is just not taking back. They're, for example, going for uh, something like this and then even just h4 and h4. And Black's just struggling. I had a game this summer in line and just got horribly crushed because even though we are up a pawn, we have no active play whatsoever. Uh, and so uh, we searched for something that kind of avoids this line. And yeah, now opt for knight g7. It looks kind of odd to like block the bishop and allow white to capture, but should white capture, we can just play knight g6 and we're regaining a pawn and white center is uh, just uh, collapsing and black gets nice play. So white normally opts for bishop d3. And now it's kind of interesting because we haven't committed to queen b6 yet. So we can take and try to like win this pawn with only the knights. And if we can do this, white does not get the same activity as in the, in the Barry Gambit. So uh, should they can be, be passive, we can, like, first of all, you're just threatening to win the pawn, but should they can try to defend it, we can actually just take it and then up for queen d3 and like queen b6 and bishop d7, because now we've won the bishop pair. But normally white just takes and think, they think, yeah, I destroyed black's pawn structure, haha. But we just take back and again, we see the point with the e, uh, e6 pawn gone, we can just park the bishop on e6 and play bishop b7, for example, like this. Uh, and now, 
we can make use of the fact that we have this double F pawns and start an attack on the king side. So we have not castled yet, so we can advance our pawns and our king is still safe. So should we like develop, we can fix the structure. And now it looks like we have a lot of light square holes on our position, but that's just great uh, is that we can actually just castle. I think Justin uh, found this nice idea in the analysis where we just want to tuck away our king on h8, play rook g8, swing the queen over, and then just go for an attack. And it looks like it's kind of shaky, but our king is perfectly safe, and we have these nice bishops. Our light square bishop is active, and again, black, black gets good and comfortable play, and white is forced to defend. So we just turn it around, it around completely. We do have this yeah, extra, to... extra pawn on f7. Sorry, Justin, go ahead. That's oh, true. Uh, I was going to say, like, to go back to the, the original question, the Greek gift shouldn't really be happening. Um, I understand, like, with the structure of the pawn on e5, it makes a lot of sense for bishop takes h7 to happen in the position. Um, but if we do develop our pieces in the correct way, it shouldn't happen. So, for example, if we play knight g7, um, just bishop d3, for example, say they they try to do something like this. If we take on d4, they're not going to be able to do any Greek gift because we haven't castled yet. And then additionally, our bishop should be on e7 in a lot of lines. And from e7, it should stop the knight from coming to g5. So this combination of, well, this bishop's blocked right now, we're not castled yet, and the bishop is going to come to e7. Uh, we are pretty well set up against the Greek gift, and it shouldn't really be a problem. Um, something else we could do is a typical thematic idea is in the future to play f6, because um, that gets rid of this annoying e5 pawn, which uh, kind of gives white a lot of their attack and attacking possibilities. So f6 in the future could kind of help. Um, but yeah, if we have our bishop on e7, we shot the square well protected, and we want a castle, it should be okay. Um, but if you're aware of the Greek gift, um, it shouldn't happen. And we just want to be aware of it. Um, and things should uh, be okay. We have a question from Ian. What's the best up-to-date book on the French defense? Also recommended players to study um, Unziker. I don't know that author. I can't think of a modern French book. Yep. Like, I believe the most uh, modern stuff you can find on the French are actually just either chess base or chess will courses where people put up. I believe there is in the Grandmasters a Raptor series, there's a book on the French like about two or three years ago. But like the basic ideas stay the same and yeah, modern books just dive uh, more into like these modern Milner Berry Gambit ideas and try to like tackle them like the mainline way. Uh, but in terms of like normal ideas, it, uh, I think it doesn't really matter if you read a book that's like from 1990 or a book that's from 2023. Yeah, the, the um, Grandmaster Repertoire book from Quality Chess on the French, Volume 3 was published March of 2015. So it's already eight years old. Um, and I think a lot of the books out there you'll find not only do they become outdated, but um, a lot of them are just geared towards higher levels. Like these quality chess books, there's three volumes. Each one is 400, 500 pages. Like volume three is 472 pages. Whereas the chess goals courses, we really try to gear them towards real players. Like 99% of chess players aren't ready to learn 1,500 pages of just the French defense. So we try to find different sidelines and common themes and ways to beat 
common mistakes at the club level. So I think, you know, even though there are some good books out there on the French, um, it's really, a, it's a tough way to study openings nowadays, I think, because we have so many online resources. Very good. Just simple said, interesting positions and plans here, guys. I could really see it throwing off your club level opponents. Oh, Jaga is saying Karpov beat Uzinker in a nice Olympiad game. The Bishop A7 idea came from there. Do you guys know that game? I cannot exactly think of a game between Karpov and Uzinker, but if it's like, and I, uh, I believe the idea is uh, known where Karpov just, I believe, mean, puts a bishop on e7 and tries to locate like the a file to just double or triple up uh, heavy pieces on that. But it could also be, uh, ah, yeah, right, yes, when close real, real locus. Yeah, we're just, we're just about tripling up on the file by locating it first with a bishop. But I believe that's a completely different topic. Oh, he's saying close, close Ray Lopez. Yeah, I was wondering, how, how does Bishop A7 come in the French? But what we actually have uh, lines where white, for example, takes early uh, on C6. Uh, by peace and allows us to go uh, bishop a6 to uh, activate our passive uh, light square bishop. So which chapters haven't we looked at so far? Two knights? If you look at the two knights... Yeah, the two knights is a very common club level uh, idea. If they ha don't really see the French all that often, they're just going to want to play simple chess. They're going to want to develop their pieces. But um, this isn't very good because they're not really able to hold on to their center. So right away, we're actually able to chip away at the center and uh, it falls apart very quickly. So if we just play knight to f6, d4 is also possible, but this is... Uh, a little bit safer and a little bit more in our comfort zone. Um, and then after knight to f6, we're obviously attacking e4. They usually try to play e5. If they take, that transposes to an exchange. e5, knight to g7. And they just can't hold on because this knight is blocking the c pawn from coming to c3. So after c5, everything just starts to fall apart. They can take on c5, and now this pawn is very weak. We can take this pawn pretty much whenever we want it. Um, again, the, the center pretty much just falls apart. We're just going to play knight c6, try to win this pawn, because that pawn uh, is, is the center pawn. It's more valuable than this weak c5 pawn. So we're going to try to go after that pawn. Um, and yeah, I believe we just have a really nice play here. I, I love these positions for black. Yeah, in general, the two knights just ends up being kind of a worse version of the classical because they cannot restructure with f four, and actually because they are kind of forced to like defend the center with pieces, we can just try to start using these pieces as a target and kind of similar to what we've seen in the uh, advanced line, we can just opt for g uh, g five here and tackle the pieces and gain a lot of space. We threaten just trap a piece and dislodge the knight from protecting the central pawn. And again, black's just the one uh, gaining the initiative here. And you can just opt for like long castle and go for a big attack. So the, the two knights is not yeah, crucial at all. It looks like a Karo advance from the Karo course, except we're up a tempo. So we didn't take two moves to play c5, but you get that similar pawn structure um, with these white pawns on e5 and c5 against this pawn chain. And it's always kind of nice in the Karo 
to just target those two pawns and knowing long term you have the pawn on d5. Yeah, right. But uh, compared to the Carolines, we already have a knight on d7 to exert more pressure onto the center, I believe. Yeah, that's true too. That's just the great thing about the French. We uh, almost always have this uh, nice structure where you can just try to chip away at the center and use natural developing moves. And if you're out of book, you can just resort to uh, these basic ideas and everything that pressurized center is, is fine at least. And yeah, only very few lines where black has to be hyper cautious to not run into anything bad. I want to mention like one of my issues when I played the French was I would kind of, I would win the center and then I wouldn't know what to do with it. So that's also a skill that's important to kind of hone when you play the French is a lot of times the center is going to fall apart um, or white's center is going to fall apart. Um, and you're going to have maybe an extra pawn. You're going to have better control of the center. And from there, it's very important um, to just try to maintain that control of the center. Don't let your opponent, like it's very important to pay attention to your opponent's resources in that um, kind of situation. Because if we can limit our opponent's resources and make sure just have total control over everything, um, then we're going to be well over, um, <laughs> we're going to be heading towards a win very quickly. So it's it's just important to have that control in the position um, once we do, or once the center does collapse. Because uh, I, I think you'll find more often than that, the center collapses and it collapses pretty quickly. Um, if your opponent doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. And uh, what's also important to know about the French is that this central structure is very solid. And we have some lines where you just keep the king at the center for uh, some moves and try to do other things. And basically, compared to the Sicilian, where white might or like knight d5 or any big sacks on e6, they normally do not work in the French because we're just solid and our king is guarded by the pieces. And yeah, we can take our time to develop pieces, maneuver around, and we're not so much worried about getting attacked. I believe the lines where we have to withstand an attack for some moves is the king's Indian attack. If you can just talk about this a little. Yep, so chapter 10. Yeah. Like the king's Indian attack is basically uh, some kind of autopilot system opening. Most white players try to employ to just go crazy and attack, attack, attack on the king's side and do not care about anything else and like from experience most club players like below 2000 are just basically autopiloting the first 12 40 moves and they think yeah fisher won like nice games with it but the french is just solid and if we are cautious this attack does not lead to anything so like the main line is where we do this like Typical French setup. They play a King's Indian setup. And uh, here we have kind of a branching point. We've gotten a nice position with, like, again, e6, d5, c5. And I can go to c6. And because white has not uh, played e5, we could park an item f6 and rotate it later on to d7. And in the course, we're opting for the main line where we basically play a, a short castle and then opt for this like reversed uh, bayonet attack. We just shove up all the uh, queenside pawns and gain space and b5, a5, and we're just rolling. Uh, and even though white might to try to attack us with like h4 and then knight g5, knight h2 and bishop f4 and 
attacking. We're just solid because we haven't moved uh, any pawns in front of our king. And this bishop is just a nice defensive piece to hold off uh, white's attackers. So the king's Indian attack is one of the lines where we go kind of in depth because the next moves are just really common for both sides. And until this point, more or less forced. If we go on uh, the national main line. And if white is not cautious and, for example, does not know to move uh, a3 to kind of stop our advances, we can already gain like a, a quite an advantage by just rolling down the queen side and provoking a lot of weaknesses and white structure oh, is kind of collapsing and we can start to uh, like collect one pawn after another. So I uh, kind of have to know that they should play a3. Again, we chip away it and get this nice bishop a6 to activate our last minor piece. And again, any attacks by white look scary at first, but we are always fast enough to defend. Like now that I see it, we can kick it away. And yeah, if I remember, remember correctly, we have like two lines uh, that branch out uh, around here. These are lines you have to remember correctly. Uh, for example, here that white can just sack or try to sack a piece, but uh, we're always in time to like get enough counterplay and defend our position. Like knight coming to f5 and stopping any advances. Like these two, uh, these two or three lines you have to know by heart, but all the other lines you can just basically play in normal French fashion and you're fine. Also, if you do not want to like, go that deep and memorize such deep lines, because I think these are like the, one of the most advanced lines we have in the course, uh, you could also just play it more crazy and do it like, uh, like we do it in the other lines and opt for actually a long castle setup where just long castle and when you push, you just go g5, h5. This is like easier to play in terms of uh, memorizing moves, but it's also quite double-edged. So in the course, we're recommending the main line with the reversed bayonet attack and yeah, because it's just objectively the best way to play and yeah, black just gets comfortable play and we are fine and most often not white will just rattle down their autopilot King's Indian attacking moves and then be at the point where you're like, oh, hang on, I'm not mating, but my queen side is collapsing. What's happening? And then, yeah, we just like out counter them. So yeah, this this b6, bishop b7, and potentially like castling long is possible. But the reason we didn't, um, like if you want an option that is uh, less kind of theory based and and just gets you a position, that's definitely a good option. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just it's not the most critical. White does get a slight advantage, um, and when they play an opening like this. We want to make sure that we're uh, getting the most out of uh, the opening and, and trying to get uh, whatever advantage what gives us. And there's a reason the main line's the main line. So that's kind of how we ended up with that. And we have a question in the chat from Chess Simple. He's wondering, do we face many of the queen g4 type stuff by white in this course? Uh, yeah, so we, we look at it, um, I believe, in the advanced aggressive. Oh, yeah, there we go, queen g4. <laughs> um, 
And yeah, so uh, Queen G4 is kind of a, a risky line for white. It's a gambit um, called the Nimsa Witch attack. And they just give up this pawn on D4. They're not going to take it back. They're just going to leave it there. And it's a, it, it's kind of important to know how to play against this because if you don't, it can be a little weird. It can um, be uncomfortable and, and not super clear how to develop since um, this pawn is being attacked. So this bishop's tied down. It's just, it's not super comfortable, but playing H5 and then h4 is kind of the key. If we can get this in, we're going to be in good shape um, and just try to kick that queen around because um, this queen is misplaced. Um, so if we just try to kick it around, attack it, attack it, attack it, um, we're going to be pretty happy with the resulting position. Um, because here we have the bishop pair, we've got a pretty active uh, rook, and we still have an extra pawn, so I really can't take it back because if they do, we're just going to take on e5 um, and have a very nice position. So, uh, yeah, we should be very good here. The key is really just to kick that queen around. So play h5, play h4, and uh, knight to h6 is also a great idea. Yeah, uh, I believe we have one sideline in the Tarash also uh, where we face queen g4. But this uh, can also just be handled uh, in a similar way. Let me just speak for it. Yeah. Which chapter, Lucas? Uh, I believe the Taraj. But let me just see. Uh, I see a queen g4 on move 16. Um, in the two knights, there's a queen g4 on move 11. Ah, right, yeah. Like, uh, here we have a line in the... Okay, this is like more advanced in the position, but normally queen g4 can be made with h5, but in this line... Uh, we can, uh, just for context, uh, this is like the main line of Tarash, and we have the normal setup. Here, white played knight g3, so we're opting for a closed position. We play a5 to stop b4, and then we are in this position where it's similar to some situations in advance where white could gambit the pawn. Uh, but here, uh, white's just not equipped uh, to gambit this pawn in the right, right way because this knight on d7 blocks any bishop checks. So uh, we can just take it and if white just keeps sacking stuff, uh, we just collect pawns. And here when they try to get active with g4, we turn tables around and we give back a pawn and now have this pretty nice tactic to simplify into uh, position where two points up, queen takes f f2 check. Like they have to take or else they get mated. And we get the queen back, they can take here, but again, we have like typical French center, we're up two pawns, everything's great. So like queen g4 can often just run into some bad counter attacks. And as you've mentioned in the two nights, yeah, I'll flip over to that one. For it. Mm. So really the only early queen g4 came from the, the first line we looked at. Yeah, so now this is a move 11 queen g4. Yeah, but again, uh, here it's also similar to the nim switch variation, and we can handle queen g5 and queen g4 the, right, uh, the same way by just going h5, h4, and this time h3 and just dropping open the king's side. And the queen g4 is normally just a target. And it looks kind of active at first, but uh, compared to like uh, poison pawn winner variation where the queen actually just collects, uh, 
quite some points. Uh, in most lines of the course, Queen G4 is not dangerous whatsoever. It does always look scary, though. You see that queen poking at g7. Yeah, but here we're just in time to defend g7 with g6 and then continue developing. Yeah, no matter what variation it is, queen g4, we're just going to harass that queen. So h h5, h4, in the other line, we saw the knight coming to f6 and attacking the queen. Just, just try to attack that queen however you can. I think pretty soon we're going to wrap up, but if you guys have any more questions for the instructors, please put them in the chat. Um, it's a cool opportunity to have you guys here. Justin and Lucas, thank you for doing this. And I wanted to mention, we do have a couple coupon codes. So there's a 35% off the French code and a 50% off the Lifetime Access Bundle. Um, the French code goes through the end of this weekend. And the lifetime access bundle code goes through the end of the month. Those are both in the description below. And all of our chess goals courses have 30 day money back guarantees. No questions asked. So you can just go try the course. And if you don't like it, ask for a refund. Um, and the reason we do that is we're pretty confident that you guys will like our courses. So if you're looking for a new defense against 1e4, check out that link in the description. Okay, we got a couple people saying thanks for doing this, Chess Simple and Ian. Good intro session. Um, I don't see any other questions yet, but let's wait like another minute and just make sure no questions roll in. We could also uh, just show some sample game uh, where we prove that our recommendations are just objectively completely uh, Base and even work on grandmaster level. We found a game where even Alreza Ferruja lost against like a, the, the typical French player. Okay, I just pulled that up. Do you want to go through yeah. it quickly, Lucas? And we'll uh, look for other questions while we go through the game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This starts as a uh, normal classical variation, knight of six. Uh, actually called like this uh, exact move order called the Steinitz, the early uh, e5. White just builds the center. And again, we're opting, uh, as opted in the course, we uh, have bishop e7, and white plays queen uh, d2, short castle. And of course, like long casting would run to c4, b5, and a big attack. So white takes here first, but uh, now we have a kind of tricky move. We could take back immediately, but this tends to just end up in a slightly passive position for black. So we play a move queen a5. We're just leaving the pawn there to recapture in the right moment. And yeah, this is following the recommendation of the course so far. And now should, uh, white castles. And again, typical theme, do not, uh, we do not want to end up in a past position. So b6, just sacking a pawn to open up the position. Yeah. Like if white were to take, we can just take back by the b pawn, have nice active files, knight coming here, bishop coming here. And yeah. And yeah, black's just really active. So, uh, Ferruja played bishop b5. And we do not want to be passive. No bishop b7, even though it's playable. Knight b4 being active. White tries to kick the knight away. Uh, now a little question on chat. What do you guys think is the move here? And as far, this is just uh, also included in course recommendation. I'm trying not to look at the answer. So if they take our knight, we have queen a1. Check.
Did something crazy, Lucas? Like night? Oh, Jaga says night A2 check. Uh, mm, night A2 check. This is interesting. Uh, Probably night S to take, I would think. Yeah. I think this is possible, but here white should be kind of good shape to just kick the queen back. And we're kind of losing the initiative here. It might be playable, yes. But uh, yeah, it's not that active. Any other guesses? I'll throw in a guess for knight takes c5, and I'm trying to get some sort of Knight b3 check craziness. Okay. One guess for knight takes c5. I think knight takes uh, c5 still lose a piece. Uh, yeah, lose a piece because we are not oh. completely in time to. Uh, get an attack it's close like, though yeah if we have like two moves the rook would already be on c8 yeah it would be decisive but it's a similar idea justin do you want to show a solution uh sure yeah so the the solution is to play b take c5 so we're just ignoring this attack on our knight taking back this pawn that was just hanging there for a long time um, and the reason we're doing this is because if uh, white were to take back here, this pawn being able to take on b4 is very powerful. So for example, if they try to throw in bishop takes c7 because they don't want to lose this bishop, um, well, we can take on c3 and it happens with check, or not with check, <laughs> it happens with tempo because we're, we're threatening the queen. Um, so white has to deal with it and then we can take that bishop. So uh, yeah, C takes, or sorry, B takes C is, is very powerful because after takes takes, we have this kind of somewhat of a double attack, remove the defender, whatever you want to call it, we're going to probably want to piece back. So um, after B takes C5, Bishop takes D7 happens. And now we just take back. Um, so this is kind of the difference. White tries to flip the move order and take back first when we don't have B takes C3. And now after A takes B, C takes B, um, we're attacking this knight. We're down a whole piece, just a full piece here. Um, but this open C file is going to give us tremendous play here. And our queen is ready to infiltrate and cause a lot of problems for white. So after knight to b1, we bring our rook in. Um, knight to d4, Alireza tries to use the knights to defend. We still play queen to a2. Uh, very, very nice square for the queen. Um, just keeping an eye on a lot of potential attacking possibilities. And Alireza um, isn't going to just sit by idly, tries to get some counterplay with f5. We take. Um, rook to f1, and now we need to figure out how to get more pressure on the queen side. We've got a lot of pieces over here. We've got a lot of pressure, but we're not really breaking through. So we start with a5. This is how, this is our plan. We're going to play a5, a4, a3, march this a pawn all the way down the board, attack b2, and potentially maybe even just get this pawn to queen. Um, it's not too far off um, from that being possible because... We have that outside pass pawn potential. So knight takes f5, takes, takes. Uh, so again, white's trying to get some pressure on the king side, but it's just not going to be enough. Play a4. Bishop to d4, trying to defend the b2 pawn. a3. So this is kind of why bishop to d4 is played. So now queen takes b2 is no longer a threat, but it still can help open things up in the position. Now white plays e6. Uh, again, Ali Rez is a fighter. He doesn't want, he's not going to give up so easily. He's going to keep trying to get his own play um, in the position. So we play f6. We just want to block that all up. Um, it would be pretty 
annoying to allow something where potentially rook to g5 works and they can sacrifice like this um although it's it gets really complicated because like most like rook takes c2 are possible now but this king is, is very weak uh, it's just it's very very messy um but whoever gets the initiative first is probably going to win so f6 is played queen to d3 um queen to d3 um just trying to give this king a square um potentially so we play b3 we're finally breaking through we've got all the problem breaks in the position on the queen side um and that king is about to get blown up wide open now rooks f2 the rooks trying to protect c2 um very important and then now we have to get the rest of our pieces into the game so we start with rook to a4 trying to double on the c file c3 so it looks like uh white is kind of holding on here because uh b2 is pretty well protected and it's not really clear how black continues here but um black has a really nice shot here that kind of collapses white's position I'm looking for the queen sacks. I don't see a queen sack though. What does Levy love to sacrifice? Oh, rook sack. Uh, okay, there's two rook sack options. Rook takes c3 and rook takes d4. Jaga saying rook takes d4 in the chat. So then if queen takes back, then what do we do, Jaga? We need a follow-up. Rick takes d4. He says bishop c5 next. Skewering the queen to the rook. So yeah, here we sacrifice the rook, rook takes d4, and then after queen takes d4, just like you said, bishop to c5. But the idea here isn't necessarily to take this rook. It's if a move like queen takes d5, we do not want to take this rook. That would be terrible because we're getting made it here instead after e7 and uh, queen to d8 is uh, going to be mate. So um, we got to be pretty careful here, or I guess e7 is not even popular. like we don't even need to play e7. We can just back rank right away. Um, but regardless, um, we can't take that rook. That's not the point. The point is here we want to play bishop to e3, and we're just checking this king and saying how are you going to deal with that check? Because however they step in front of this d2 square, it's going to block. The protection of b2 so for example rook to d2 oops well that's just me um and it's not very clear how they defend this because whatever piece steps on so that d2 square is going to get pinned and there's nowhere else for this king to go um so this is kind of the, the reason why this is so so deadly and uh why queen takes c4 followed by bishop c5 is so powerful so he has to keep an eye on that e3 square and then bishop takes f2 um, queen takes f2, and now, just like I, I kind of hinted at earlier, this a pawn is the key. Um, white can't take on a3, and after a move like queen to a1, it's very tricky. We're ready to play a2 next. So the key move is, what if, what if white just takes it? So what happens here? This is not playing the game, but it's important to look at. Any guesses from, from chat? My instinct is to play rook takes c3. That's what Jaga is saying in the chat. Yeah, very good. So rook takes c3 is the best because this knight is pinned and once the king moves, um, we can kind of just clean up, 
play move like rook c2 and win the queen. So, uh, yeah, very nice. So there's really no way to stop a2. So white tries to get their own counterplay with e7. We play a2 anyway. A queen to try to deflect our rook takes queen to f5 to protect uh, the square. But now this this is just a crazy move. Black plays d4. And then white resigns after this. Move. That's just it's just such a such a nice move, because um, you can't take back. You can't take back either way, and we're ready to take back on c three this way. Um, so it's very very dangerous. Um, so for example, let's say c takes d four. Um, so how would we combat this? What would, what would we play here? I wanted to play rook c8 check, but that could be a pretty big blunder. Yeah. I don't see any answers in the chat yet. I'm wondering if we can slow play this a little bit. I want to play a move like g6 and just threaten some things. Like the queen's trying to guard c8 and the queen's trying to guard b1. Can we somehow take advantage of that? So queen d5 check. Yeah, you are getting a lot of checks. King g7. I think after king h8, there's no more checks, right? Oh, king h8. Yeah, you're right. King h8. Is that the answer? G6? I don't know. <laughs> G6 looks pretty nice, though, because white is really just frozen, and, and they do have to keep an eye on both of these squares. Um, it is possible that they could allow rook to c8. Um, it gets really tricky here, but I think I think G six um works. I think there's multiple answers, so I think G six works. Um, I just took a peek. G six is mate in twelve, but there's two. There's like a mate in eleven. Two mate in eleven moves. Oof. And Jaga got it. He said B one equals queen. So takes takes. I think these are tricky positions for us non-GMs. Like, okay, it looks like white's defending everything, but you can actually just drop your queen back, mm -hmm. and it's you're still gonna win. Yeah, yeah. Queen a five is really strong because you're you're covering this d two square, and rook c eight is coming next, and the queen is just it's so powerful. It's potentially going to g five potentially able to go on the a file if the king slides over king queen a2 is a problem and the queen just covers everything from a5 um and the rook is coming to c a2 yeah and can this pawn on b3 is just a nail in a coffin for white and yeah it just allows all these nice attacking ideas and even though white has like this nice pass pawn and it's just equal material like much more active and as the pieces float in and I mean just this heavy piece sandwich on the back rank is is not good for white. <laughs> hmm. And then the other thing was after d4, this one's a little bit simpler. If a rook takes d4, um what do we do here? Jaga's saying b1 equals queen. Yeah, so b1 equals queen takes, and then what? He said rookie one check. The rookie one check is great. This ends up in mate. There's actually a better room. I'm better at falling for these than spotting them. 
Queen takes B1, Jaga. Queen takes Queen, says Chess Simple. Very nice. Yeah, the pawn on B3. Again, the nail in the coffin. Um, yeah, it's a very, very crazy um, queen set attack and a very cool finish. I kind of, uh, what's nice to mention is uh, throughout the whole game, black is just going crazy and attacking and is ready to sacrifice uh, pieces and like, pawns and pieces to open up lines. And the black king is just completely safe uh, around here on the king side to the uh, pawns in front of it. And even though white tries to get active, there's never any real danger where we like have to exactly calculate and be like uh, on the point one move faster. But yeah, we're just rolling and uh, like basically F6 is the only uh, a crucial defending move we have to make and after that white is just forced to defend retreat pieces and get sacked on yeah a more or less an effortless uh, attack from black and white never got really the chance to like put up a big fight so yeah again showing like the nice potential of the french defense All right, so I think that wraps up all the questions that we had for today. So I wanted to thank everyone for coming to attend the show. I wanted to thank our instructors, Lucas and Justin, for doing this kind of overview of the course, walking us through key lines, answering questions, and this awesome model game showing Ali Reza getting crushed against the French. Um, I'll let you guys each have a last word for the chat before we wrap up, but I just wanted to tell them Thanks for watching. Check out the coupon codes in the description if you're interested in our courses. There is a free money back guarantee in the first 30 days. Um, Lucas, you want to go first? Do you have any parting words before we wrap up? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having us here on the stream and thanks for the opportunity to make this French course. It was really fun to work together with Justin. And I believe this French course will give you guys a lot of fun to analyze and play and Dive, dive deeper into like the interesting ideas and if you have any questions you can just uh, ask us on the discord server and we are always ready to talk with you about this opening yeah i i think uh another thing is, is some people get discouraged when they, they play a new opening um because they just like they, they lose they don't really they're not really comfortable with it but if you just stick with it a little bit if you play a little bit more um and don't just like have that perseverance to keep playing um despite the the initial losses you can really get a good understanding of the positions and have a really strong edge on your opponent if you do get that understanding so um don't get discouraged if it doesn't work out right away there is a lot of fun lines um, in the French to explore. Um, but sometimes people kind of, it, it's not intuitive, intuitive to them right away. So they kind of go to something else. But if you want to learn the French, um, it is important to try to stick to it and uh, really understand the ideas of the opening. So if you lose a game, that's all right. Just try to learn from that game, figure out what um, you can take from it in the future. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming to watch today and I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Lucas. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.